All right, welcome to our June meeting and our main talk from Marius coming up soon about the play framework. So uh, yeah, we've got uh, ways to keep in touch. We have a mailing list, which you can join from our website, which is tjug.ca. We have a Google Plus community and a meetup group, thanks to the proceeds from our Java 8 tutorial day. Uh, Deeb started that up for us. So it's great. Lots of ways to keep in touch. And we post videos on, it's on YouTube these days, but you can always find the links at tjug.ca slash videos. So news this month. I may have been remiss in some of the obvious headlines, so please feel free to contribute when I get to the end and I haven't said the obvious thing. Uh, there is a jug discount for Java 1. If you sign up now, this week, you can get $200 off in addition to the $400 early bird discount. Use that discount code, DJU4. Or you could Google for like a better discount code. I don't know if there is one. but um, So uh, Delvic got put in the back seat as of the new Android release that was announced to Google I.O. recently. They have a new thing that's based on an ahead of time compiler that converts um, the uh, DEX, DEX bytecode to whatever the processor is on the local device when you install an app. Uh, Google claims their marketing claim is twice the performance improvement to all apps. I don't know even what that sentence means, but it's a quote that I got from the article. So. Twice the performance improvement over the performance improvement of the unspecified alternative. Um, <laughs> and uh, they have also warned developers on their developer page that they are planning to introduce a compacting garbage collector, which is a really good idea, something we've had in hotspots since, I don't know what, like 2001 or something, um, soon. So they warn you if you're writing code that's like both native and interpreted that you shouldn't keep pointers to objects in the Java heap because they're going to start moving around soon. But that'll be good for memory and speed. So that's interesting. We have some Android developers here, people who mentioned that. So it's good. Keep your eye on art. Make sure your apps work in it. Uh, the Duke's Choice Award has been an annual tradition at Java 1 since forever. And you can nominate yourself or someone you know or, or a stranger. Um, the deadline this year is July 11th, so you can go to java.net slash Duke's Choice. Uh, and I just included a list of some of the previous winners to give you an idea of the types of things that tend to win. The Glassfish community um, has a new program called FishCat. It's their community acceptance testing. And what they're looking for is people to volunteer to help try out Glassfish 4.0.1 before it goes final. And they're looking for feedback on gaps in EE7 feature completeness, and of course, just regular old bugs and so on. So if you're a Glassfish user or planning to become one, you should probably get involved in this before the final release comes out. And the JCP, uh, it turned 15 years old this month. So that's been around as a while. It's changed hands from Sun to Oracle. It's kind of like stalled and restarted. It's had some famously big blow-ups and departures, but it's mostly just still the JCP that we've always known. So I don't know how aware we all are of the JCP in our day-to-day -day lives writing Java code, but is it, does anyone have any like JCP complaints they need to like air? This would be a great time. I haven't quit the JCP in a big flame war or anything, so I don't, I don't have any particular insight. Um, anybody care to hazard a guess what might happen to the JCP in the next 15 years? I know Rod Johnson was particularly outspoken about how the JCP is irrelevant, so Spring users might. No? OK. Uh, so that was the end of the news. I don't know if anybody else has stuff that I missed. Probably. No? Yeah, you missed the Eclipse release. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. I knew I missed something giant. Yes, Eclipse. Um, the 
like uh, Luna. Luna came out yes, just Luna recently. It seals a lot faster than the previous version. Nice. Based on one day of using it. I was thinking of upgrading it to it today, but I had too many other things to do. <laughs> Actually, it's uh, the Spring, Spring, Spring I.O. 1.0. What does Spring I.O. do? It's basically like a unified basically it's a release train that contains all the uh, like all the spring frameworks in the unified stack including uh, maven bombs for compatibility between projects and stuff like that cool okay spring io 1.0 as well I missed all those things Okay. It's available in Polymer. Just go to Polymer website. It's actually going to be part of Polymer. Cool. The, the, um, there's a widget set called Paper, which is a, um, a web component widget set. Oh, you guys do a company release? No, no, no. It's, it's Polymer. It's part of Polymer. Oh, Polymer. Google, just, Google just donated it to Polymer. Okay. So now if you want your app to look like a Google app, you can do so. It's called Paper? Paper. Yeah. It's part of their whole new... Um, Okay. Paper. I'll check that out too. Relevant to what I do. That was that. Okay, time for Robocode. So we have two new entries, um, one from Andrew and one from Andrew. Um, <laughs> And we also have previous entries that can replay. So Robocode, if you don't know what it is, you will soon. Just give me a second. I have to OK, so BadBot, this is one of the new entries. Got these are previous entries. All right, start battle. It's not making sound. I think I might have reverted to the version of Snowflake that has the movement bug in this one that's, that like makes it better. Ah, you can't say. It was close. A close match. Snowflake's yours, Jeremy? Yeah. I, I made an improvement. I fixed a bug in it, and it started losing. I threw a random left hook next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should. I volunteer yours. So hello and good evening, and I'm glad that you are here for uh, a talk about the Play framework. My name is uh, Marius Bogovic. You actually uh, heard when, what I do earlier when we got introduced to each other. And today I'm kind of happy to talk about uh, the Play framework. How, uh, how many of you have actually tried it, or heard of it? Heard of it. Tried it? OK, so that will save you, like, at least like, if you don't like it, at least you have saved like, an hour of your time and just uh, went through a presentation of, like, through an introduction of the framework. Because the thing that I like to do today, I don't kind of, I've been kind of lazy. I didn't prepare a lot of slides. I think we should just go a little bit of an overview and try some live coding and see actually a couple of applications that work and see what the framework is, is all about. How many of you are interested in that? Yeah. Cool. So that's the right call. Um, the thing with play, like how do we come to this presentation? Um, in our stack, we use, like in the stack that we use in Infinity Quick, we actually use play. And uh, right now it's not a major component, but we actually kind of tried, tried, to, tried to pilot a project with it and we found a few things which are very, uh, very interesting. And it actually makes for, for a very, uh, very productive, very performant uh, web framework. And uh, I kind of try to convey that kind of uh, idea across to the demo and everything like that. Basically, this is what the, the authors of the framework have to uh, uh, say about it. This is how it positions itself. Like a modern, uh, a full stack web framework, what does it mean? It means that it has everything like top down, including an embedded application server. Um, it should be said that unlike other Java 
based uh, web frameworks, it's not Java EE based. So essentially, it skips the whole uh, servlet API and basically dives direct, ties the, uh, the framework itself directly into the, uh, uh, into, that, into the container that's actually embedded in. Um, and, you know, it's um, based on, like, it, follow, it has a, a reactive, event-driven architecture, which is based on uh, Scala and ACA, right? How many of you have heard of ACA? Uh, so that's kind of, that, that's the foundation of the framework, right? Why do we talk about it? Why are we interested? Obviously, the framework itself has received a lot of, uh, uh, has received a lot of uh, good press, so to speak. For its productivity, it actually has uh, uh, some pretty, uh, like pretty serious use cases. If you're interested, for example, in uh, uh, the use of Play Framework at LinkedIn, they, have, uh, they actually have some uh, uh, good resources about it, very detailed how they use it and some of the best practices around it. So it's, 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 uh, it's actually well received and uh, it's actually used in production by some, uh, uh, like in, in some big web applications. But you actually shouldn't believe that. Like that shouldn't be your, your motivation for it, really. What you like to do is basically see how it works. Um, a little bit more about it is like another interesting uh, resource if you're interested to, to see uh, a little more about and learn how it compares with other frameworks. It's the uh, Rebel Labs review of, of uh, <coughs> web frameworks. So the 2014 Decision Makers Guide to Java Web Frameworks, this is how we call it. They actually pit a few frameworks uh, together. And their conclusion was that uh, like their top three choices would be Vadin, Grails, and Play. Like usually, to understand where, like, where it actually positions itself, play is typically pitted against, uh, against Grails as one of the two uh, most productive GVM-based uh, uh, frameworks. Also, Matt Rabel's web framework comparison is actually uh, placing it pretty, pretty high in its, in its uh, choices. Again, if you're interested about like more of the figures, more details about how it, it compares, it's another good research to go and, uh, and study. So, very briefly, <laughs> as I said, the, uh, the framework itself has uh, its a Scala. Like internally, it's, it's written in Scala, built on top of ACA, and allows like Allows development like allows developers to create web applications using either Java or Scala. Um, its foundation is asynchronous I/O, so natively HTTP requests are using um, uh, Neo through Netty, which actually is like it's basically deployed in, instead of it. Why is that important? It's important because uh, it allows better scalability. Why does it do that? Obviously, if you don't have, like the traditional blocking model is based upon the assumption that every request will be processed by a thread. Now, that means that you have to have a large number of threads to process a large number of concurrent requests. The, using Netty and using NIO, they actually manage to have, like to process a large number of waiting requests with a much more reduced number of threads because essentially the communication is event driven. Threads don't block. It's relying, it's, uh, it's relying on operating system calls to actually wake up the tasks that are waiting for, uh, for input from uh, the various sources. The programming model is like a few strengths of the framework. It's having a programming model that's based on a heat refresh paradigm. What does it mean? It means that I change my source code, I hit refresh, and the application basically is like the code is, 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 completely, uh, is completely refreshed. So it's, I don't have to compile and uh, 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 redeploy. 
Type safety is important. How many, like, especially when you have to uh, uh, manage a large code base, and actually that's a result of supporting Java and Scala. It has a comprehensive build system that actually doesn't only <coughs> deal with like source, like, with dependency management and all the other stuff that comes with that, but also can handle things like, for example, uh, pre-compilation of JavaScript, like for example from CoffeeScript, or compilation of uh, less into CSS. <coughs> From an architecture perspective, it's fully restful. Um, everything is, is essentially uh, driven by uh, routes, as you will see. It has a type safe template model. JSON is a first class citizen, and as I said, it has an integrated application server. Um, in terms of scalability, like one of, it, it's very scalable because it, it's web here is fully stateless. There is no such thing as a session context, for example, as in the servlet framework, which means that you can essentially deploy any number of, of uh, play instances and just have a load balancer basically sending requests across and you can actually distribute the load much more, uh, much better. <coughs> Again, the native non-blocking I.O. through embedded Meti uh, contributes to that. It's internal architecture that's event-driven and reactive also does the same thing. And all, all of these actually, like because it's so, because it's, it's uh, stateless, because it's easy to deploy, because it's actually uh, not, like it's, it's uh, because it embeds its own uh, Server, so it's actually very easy to, to create a deploy package. It's very cloud friendly in that respect, right? So we can actually scale it very easily. Um, in terms of internal support, it has support for uh, uh, relational persistence, like things like object relational mapping. Uh, it comes with its own persistence framework, which is eBeans, very similar to JPA but also has support for direct SQL, like in uh, like a number of uh, Scala-based frameworks, Enorm, Slick, and Squirrel. Um, it has integration with uh, uh, NoSQL databases, such as MongoDB, and uh, that's through uh, a number of, uh, um, sorry, a number, uh, through a number of uh, uh, drivers and frameworks, but the most important one that we're actually going to see tonight is Reactive Mongo. It has internally an asynchronous programming model through iterates, and if we have time, we're, just, we're going to take a look at that too. And it also comes with uh, uh, to an internal cache. So the way it actually handles state for the uh, management of state for, for an application is like, if you think of something like a shopping cart, instead <coughs> of holding data on the session, it actually comes with uh, its own cache or data grid is actually using uh, EH cache internally, but there are other plugins that allow you to replace that. And instead of like, you basically, your web requests are essentially processed through a stateless tier, but can, uh, that can actually talk to a data grid for uh, storing it and basically passing the, rate, the data between the nodes. And that's pretty much it. Like these are kind of my conclusions, but instead of doing that, I'd like to skip that part and actually start uh, developing an application and kind of illustrating the points that I've, I've, uh, I've made earlier, right? So let's start doing that, right? It's actually like for creating an application, um, the simplest, like the way you actually, what you, need, what you need to do is basically go download the play framework, unzip it, set it on the path, and, you, and we are good to go. So we're going to create two applications tonight, very fast. One is going to be an app, a Java-based uh, play application using eBeam, and you will see uh, how Java and the eBeam persistent model work. And then we're going to take a look at uh, another application that uses Scala and MongoDB. And that will actually illustrate something more than just the access to the persistence, but also 
uh, we'll take a look actually at the reactive programming model that's uh, enabled by reactive Mongo. So let's get started. Now, I'm going to work on the example, and I'm going to explain what I'm doing. If you have any questions, just feel free to raise a hand or just shout, and I'll pay attention. But feel free to, to uh, ask questions as we move along. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a play project. So I'm going to do, I'm going to say, yeah. By the way, uh, does everyone see the screen? Is it too small? Do you need it a bit larger? Larger? OK. better now? All right, so we're going to create an application. It's asking me what's the application name. We're going to create a Java app. OK, so the application is generated now. That's kind of cool. And if you want to look at, to take a look very quickly if, at what has been generated, we can take a look here. Because I didn't create it in the directory that I was expecting. Let me just do it very quickly. Okay, so we have the we have the application like a fully fledged uh, application here. Let's try to run it and see what happens. So basically, just by typing play run, I can start it all together. And it loads the project definition. Resolves the dependencies, and the application has started. And that is actually super cool, because we can see it running on port 9000. And you see it here, uh, actually, a very simple app, which does virtually, doesn't do virtually anything. But is actually a good illustration of, of uh, we, we can take a look at it and see uh, how it's structured and understand a little bit more about the framework. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the app. And I'm going to load it in IntelliJ. Actually, for us to be able to uh, take a closer look at it, so I'm going to open I'm going to open this application, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a run configuration. And have the application running in the uh, in the background while we while we take a look at it. application has started, and there it is, the same thing. Now, what the early command, like what Play New has generated, is actually an application, like it's, it's generating the entire application structure, 
A play application has a number of predefined folders. The app folder contains the sources. So it follows the kind of typical structure. Like it, it's play applications are model view controller apps. So the controllers package will contain the controller for, for of the application. Views contain the uh, view templates and conf has the configuration. And if we take a look at the uh, at the controller, you actually see that it's a very uh, like very very simple uh, method that actually what it does it's basically returning a response which is the result of rendering a view and passing an, and passing some arg some information to that particular view for uh, rendering. One interesting thing that I like you to pay attention is the fact that the controller method is static. This is how far the framework authors go <coughs> to actually make sure that uh, the application is completely stateless. There are no proxies in between. There are no, essentially, there are no object instances. Everything is totally stateless, right? Now, one thing that I could do right now is to change this, right? So I'm going to change this code over here, and I'm going to refresh the application. And it changed. This is basically how fast changes are applied in play applications. They're recompiled immediately. Classes are swapped on, like, are reloaded immediately, and the application continues. And the ability of doing so is also a function of the fact that it's completely stateless. It's basically there is no data that has to be compatible with the new data model. It's just code, right? And that, sure, we're we're gonna add. It will reload everything. So we can add methods. You can add. Uh, uh, we'll actually do that in a minute. The other thing that I like, so if I do something Sorry. more Can you make the font a little bit bigger? in uh, IntelliJ? Yes, please. Yeah, no problem. I have an here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I asked for the, uh, for the command line, but in Interface, int you should have asked for the, um, for IntelliJ as well. So. Thank you. Better? Okay, so I changed the, I changed the code, and right now it's it doesn't compile anymore. So what happens if I try to reload this application? Boom, it fails to reload. And not only that, it fails to reload, but it actually gives me information about where the compiling errors, what the compiling errors are. So that's pretty useful again if I'm trying to to uh, develop uh, rapidly. Now, some of you might wonder. Okay, fine, this is not the kind of stuff that I want to show my users when they actually access my app on the web and see my source code. Again, that's not a problem. What we're doing right now, we're running play in development mode. This happens in development mode. In, in, uh, um, in production mode, which is uh, basically started uh, using start in instead of run, this error won't show up. You would just get a generic error and a pointer to the logs. We actually have to find the actual, uh, the actual problem. So now I'm going to fix this error, and everything works fine. Now let's take a little, like, let's take a closer look at the at the rest of the app. So basically, as I said, in the conf folder, I have routes. Now routes are essentially mappings. What do they map? A, an HTTP verb, a path, and a controller method. Uh, that's kind of cool. That's uh, that's okay. That's something you, you would expect essentially from a uh, request-driven framework. The interesting thing, and what we're going to see later, is that this file is not applied as such. It's actually compiled into a class of its own. So a little bit later, we're going to we're going to take a look at how to uh, uh, use those routes in a uh, control, like in a type-safe manner. So let's do our first, like, if I had a question if I can add a method, right? 
So let's try to see how, the, how it deals with uh, parameters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an adder method, which doesn't do too much, but adds two numbers. Okay. So I'm going to say this maps to controllers application, and I'm going to call it add with x and y being integers. And that's pretty cool. Now that's ID integration actually helps me because I can generate the method like this. It's not perfect because it doesn't know how to do Java. Uh, yep. Thank you. And that's it. Now, how do I compose a response? Is essentially so. I have some. I have two path arguments that I want to pass to the method. They're they're integers, and what I want to return is their uh, uh, is the uh, the result of the uh, their addition. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say it's going to say something like x plus sorry. What does this do? It says return response 200. So I have this DSL to uh, this method OK. And this is the content that I want to run. And I'm going to say adds 2 and 3. All of a sudden, I get a new method. And you see how fast, actually, the, basically the result came up. Getting back to the template, the template is actually another uh, another interesting thing and another powerful feature of uh, <coughs> of uh, of play. So this, what I'm saying here is that I have to render the template index, which is to be found in the views package, in a file called index.scala.html. And if you take a look at this template, you can see that. It's more or less like it's it's a structure that compiles to a Scala object. So this is kind of a function definition. This is the type of design is actually inspired by how many of you have used Razor from .NET? It's it's the same kind of it's the same kind of idea. The interesting, another, like, the interesting thing about these templates is that they're type safe. What does it mean? It means that these are arguments. These are type safe function arguments. So were I to change this to integer, for example, right? First, I would get a compiling error here, and I'll explain immediately why. But more importantly, I'm going to get a compiling error here, which says that I can't really send this thing as an argument to the view. The view expects something else. And that's, again, another important feature for development, especially when you're, um, uh, especially when you're trying to maintain a coherent code base. Because like, if you had the, template, the kind of template engine where you would pass something like a context, with bound variables and stuff like that, you normally learn that you, you haven't provided all the necessary arguments at runtime. This is giving you actually compile time validation of the way we are actually using the templates. So that's, um, that's, another, very, uh, that's another very cool feature. So let me fix the, uh, um, the view. Now these views are not only. Um, not only uh, type safe, but they're also composable. So what I'm doing here, and I'm saying, well, in the index template, I'm actually delegating to the main template, which is here. And as you see, it's actually, uh, it, it takes two arguments, a string, and some content that's embedded. 
And I'm invoking it by passing the string. And actually, I'm having this block that generates HTML, which delegates further to uh, um, um, this uh, internal predefined template, which renders the whole documentation and everything like that. I can replace that. So I could say simply, I could say simply something like this. And that changes the message, right? Changes the content. OK, so that's how you feel about the play framework so far. Like it? Not like it? Yay, nay? <laughs> Actually, we haven't seen too much about it. Like, all these things are cool as, uh, like, as, as, foundation, uh, as foundational features. They're very, very critical for that. Let's try to do something more serious now. Right? Let's try to have some kind of, let's try to do a bit of uh, CRUD. So what we're going to do is we're going to have, uh, we're going to manage some movies. So the first thing that um, I would like to have here is another, like one of the packages that misses in this structure is the mod of the web, uh, of the web application. So by definition, Play applications use uh, models package to actually store their uh, classes. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a few things. First, we're going to enable persistence in play. So we're going to go to this configuration file. And here you have, like you can, yeah, here you have. Um, <coughs> the option of defining one or more data sources. We're going to use, like, we're going to define the default data source. In fact, we're going to uncomment uh, the predefined, the uh, generated uh, code for that. And the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to enable eBean. eBean is the, is Play's persistence framework for Java applications. It's very similar, and it's actually like easier to understand. It actually reuses, for example, uh, JPA bindings, but it actually adds a little bit more. It's more oriented towards um, an um, active object type of framework. And we'll actually see how that works in a sec. Um, so now, once I did these two things, I can start defining my model. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to start copying and pasting code so that we can cover more stuff. All right. Yeah, it takes the imports. Generate some getters and setters. I'm not sure what it did to the models, but the package declaration. So basically, this is your this is the definition of an entity. As you see, it's using exactly like it's using uh, JPA mappings. But there are two things that are different in this case. One is the um, one is the fact that it extends this mod class that adds some methods that allow my entity to work in an active record type of manner. The other one is this finder, which is a generic uh, uh, persistence method that kind of implements some generic operations like find all, find by certain criteria, and so on and so forth. Or you can implement your own. So with, the, with these two things on my class, I can actually go forward and start loading the framework. And all of a sudden, I get an error. What does it mean? There's another thing that happens when you actually uh, right when you start adding entities to your application. The schema of your application changes. So 
play actually has this concept of evolution inside, like built in the framework. There is this folder, which actually you can see it has been, that has been generated right now, because I'm using eBeans, that contains definitions of SQL file, like SQL, uh, uh, basically they're DDL files. By looking at the, at the database, actually they're able to infer if all the evolutions, like all these files have been applied. And they ask you to actually go and uh, uh, apply the changes further. When you're using eBeans, you get this, like you have that uh, database auto creation feature enabled. When you use other things like SQL frameworks, like ANORM or something like that, you would actually have to write your own persistence files. But it doesn't matter. Like the application will not start until the framework is actually convinced that you have, like your database is essentially in sync with what the application expects it to be. Again, another useful feature when you're trying to uh, deploy. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna apply the script. Cool. So now that we have a model and uh, uh, now that we have a model and uh, um, a database, let's try to do something else. And that something else will be that we're going to start, we're going to create uh, routes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two routes here, one for adding movies, one for uh, retrieving, like for one, one for adding, one for retrieving a movie list. And then we're going to create we're going to create controllers for both methods. And then the next the last thing to do is that we're going to create a template to actually display that um, information. Okay, so let's go to the template. Again, I'm going to try to move a little faster here rather than typing. So I'm going to create a file, which is going to call, be called movies Scala HTML. And this is a template definition. What does this template say? Well, it accepts a list of movies. I have to, I have to use this uh, Java util list definition because eBeans is a Java framework. If I would have used lists, then it would have been, like the template would have inferred that we are using a, Java, uh, a Scala list. And then with this, uh, uh, with this list of movies, I'm actually displaying how many movies I have, right? See this um, uh, at sign actually prefixing essentially what is Scala code. And then I display the list of movies. I also have a form that allows me to add movies. So I'm using a predefined, again, a predefined play template that generates me a form. And this is actually the URL where I want the form to post its data. And this is basically what I've been talking about earlier about the routes being type safe. So rather than going in, and uh, saying, I want like I want this URL, I want this form to send data to this URL. I'm just using the mapping. Why is that important? It's important because I can go and change and refactor my mappings, and without having to change anything in my code, they will start using the new uh, the new path definitions automatically, and that's pretty powerful. So that's pretty cool. And right now we have the form, we have the uh, But we don't have the methods. So for the methods, we're going to go and add, like the uh, first, we're going to go and add the method that creates the movie. So the movie is created by binding the data from this, from, uh, from the request to a movie instance essentially follows the convention that the fields that I'm submitting. Hmm? Validation. Uh, validation is actually done on the model. 
So you can have things like required, for example, or stuff like that on, on the model itself. You can specify. Is that like the Dean validation JSR? Um, I think they have their uh, I think they have their own annotations. Okay. So you annotate your JPA entities with uh, something. Yes. Is it is that the Play framework or is that EDS? Um. I don't think there is a kind of a very clear distinction okay. between the two. I mean, uh, I think I think it's play though. Okay. The way they actually uh, develop. Yeah, you can get you can get some errors in in the web page. So we display like your form will actually contain some errors in there. I mean, it will be server side validation. Or it will be I'm sorry. It will be server side. It will be yes, it is correct. It will be server side validation. So all the basically uh, that kind of validation actually is done. Like if you use the binding, the validation is done when the form parameters are actually bound to the uh, uh, to the object. Well, time provided, we're going to take a look at how Scala works. And actually, I, I have to say that the Scala binding is much nicer. It's much more much more uh, expressive. Show me an example. Um, honestly, play like for all the thing, play is mostly a, a Scala-oriented framework. It's it can be perfectly used for for Java, like if you're if you're a Java developer. But it actually shines when when you use uh, when you use Scala. But so we have all these things, and we actually can go here and say. I haven't seen the word post anywhere. Does anybody else see it? I'm sorry. Oh, post. The post method is missing. Yes. I forgot the post, did I? <laughs> but look, <laughs> but look what happens. Like if I if I have a method that I haven't defined, that then I have this to do placeholder that actually tells me that well, I botched the job. So yeah, that's the. I, actually, the post method is add movie. Sorry, I don't have the. I I put the I bound the get method, not the post. The I'm sorry. So let's go back to the routes. Oh, okay. So post actually binds to add movie, and get binds to binds to get movies. Right. And what I'm doing essentially is like very very simply I'm fetching the data using the finder finder, and sending it to the template and yeah. It won't work. It won't work. It won't work like that. No, no. It's uh, well, it doesn't follow. Like it, it doesn't work like Spring MVC in that respect. So it, it expects or rejects or S or anything like that. It, it really expects to retrieve the binding to the to the binding API. Okay. <coughs> All right. So we get the page. We have the movies. We enter a movie title. Anyone? <laughs> okay. You're nobody remember. Nineteen fifty. Yeah. Um and basically that's pretty much it. Like this is this is the whole this is the whole flub. Right. This is a very simple CRUD based example with uh, uh, using a persist like using uh, uh, using e beans and uh, a relational database. I'd like to do something similar right now, and I'm going to do it with Scala and Mongo. And actually, Scala and Mongo are interesting for an, for more than the reason that it uses NoSQL. Any any of you uh, using or taking an interest in NoSQL? Mongo, what uh, what are you using? Cassandra. Cassandra. 
I don't want to enter the Mongo versus Cassandra debate. Uh, so later tonight, yeah, after a couple of beers. Uh, My throat says it all. <laughs> yeah. So you have it. Okay. So I'm gonna stop this right now. Very. I'm going to generate a project using Scala very quickly. And we're going to use reactive Mongo for actually connecting to, uh, to MongoDB. So I'm going to start Mongo in the meantime. And I'm going to do, OK. I'm going to play uh, Scala. OK. And create a project on Mongo. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to go here. OK. It's generating the idea, of the IntelliJ project for, uh, for basically the IntelliJ oh, files. How is it different from, let's say, importing IDEA? For importing it into IDEA? Well, okay. it's not very. Like, IDEA has, basically, IDEA's play integration does virtually the same thing. Mm -hmm. So they actually look at the project and run play under the scenes. There is a similar task for, for Eclipse as well. So I'm just on the IntelliJ side of the debate. OK, so this has generated the project that we know, we all the files that we know. Actually, this is different. You can see this as a Scala object. Um, one nice, one nice things about about the Scala, like about Scala projects, is that they're um, um, like very, um, really, really, very terse. So that's I find I personally find a little bit like I don't even find the Java like the Java version a little bit verbose compared to Scala. Like they're very, the DSL is actually very nice. So instead of having a method returning a result, I actually here, here I have an action, but the concept is pretty much the same. I'm using the uh, OK uh, function to actually wrap a response and send it back. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start enabling, uh, we're going to start by enabling the Mongo integration. So I'm going to basically, the way, this is actually also an example of, of how uh, Play's extensibility works. So for integrating with Mongo, I'm actually using a plugin, which plugin will actually invoke the reactive Mongo driver and will create the uh, uh, connection and the connection to the Mongo database uh, and everything else based on the uh, configuration. So, uh, okay, let me go back, copy this. I'm going to enable the plugin in Mongo. I'm going to go and add. Um, so I'm going to add Reactive Mongo as a uh, dependency. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and pull the project definition so that it adds all the dependencies. Okay. And I'm going to create, um, I'm going to add a definition to the uh, application conf, which is used by the plugin, which actually points me to the uh, MongoDB database that I already started. So I'm going to use a local database and uh, a local. MongoDB instance with the uh, Jug Play database. So that's pretty cool. All right. So let's start by creating uh, the model. 
I'm gonna grab this. Okay, you. I'm gonna create a new Scala class called Movies. I'm gonna map it. Uh, MongoDB mapping is, is a bit simpler. So if you're familiar with how Mongo works, essentially, is how many of you are familiar with Mongo? It's, well, essentially, think of it as a uh, document storage system, right? Everything is, uh, is a huge, uh, like, set. Uh, MongoDB instance is a set of databases which have collections, and inside the collections there are documents. And documents can have, uh, like, unlike, like, unlike a relational database where each table has a predefined structure, in Mongo each document can essentially uh, have its own schema. That doesn't really happen. Like, usually doc a lot of times documents in a particular collection follow a certain, uh, a certain pattern, right? And basically each document in that collection has a, collection, has a set of properties, right? Uh, no, no, Scala is not. Like Scala is, is, is a bit less finicky about the uh, uh, class uh, file name association. But you know, like to avoid any confusion, I'm gonna rename it like this. <coughs> All right. So now, having this defined, we're gonna copy some stuff from the uh, from the other example. I'm going to go here. I'm going to copy the template over. So OK. I'm going to go and also uh, copy the routes. I'm going to predefine the application controllers. Okay, sorry. All right. And now, what are we going to do is we're going to create the methods that actually access uh, Mongo and read and write documents. So, in this case, for Mongo, I have a uh, like my controller with extend. Uh, sorry, with Mongo controller. So there is a trait. How many of you are familiar with uh, traits in in Scala? So basically, a trait is some. Probably I will I will get under like under fire for this. It is something between an interface and an abstract class. It's a trait can have method definitions, right? And they're inherited by classes, but they are not instantiable, right? Mongo, the Mongo controller trait comes with some predefined functions and properties, which essentially offer access to uh, to MongoDB. So to take an example, I'm going to show you how the uh, movies, like the method for retrieving movies, should look like. I'm in the wrong project, I know. All right. First, I have to change the type of the <coughs> argument to the movies list to make it a Scala list. Let's take a look at, the, at this particular method that I just wrote. 
So let me do this step by step. This thing here, which is actually pretty long, and uh, it's a little bit unfriendly to read. What does it mean? It means I'm going to read from the movies collection in the database that I'm pointing on. I'm going to try to find all movies, so I'm not supplying any search criteria. And I'm going to return a collection. I'm going to return a list of movies from the uh, like from the cursor re returned by, by MongoDB. That's cool. Basically, I'm returning a list. The important thing that you have to pay attention, and this is, again, one of the reasons why I like this example very much, is that what this returns is, in fact, a future. All the calls to reactive Mongo are asynchronous. Right? Why is that important? Well, it is important because if you remember when, the, when I started the discussion, I said one of the advantages of play is that it deals, like it, it handles uh, requests in an asynchronous fashion. So it uses Neo for mapping HTTP requests to threat, right? That's super cool. It can live with a smaller thread pool because requests themselves like the, the uh, it doesn't follow the one request, uh, one thread per HTTP request model that you normally have with blocking, uh, like with blocking connectors. The problem is, however, is that if the thread that handles the request is by itself blocking, then we achieve nothing. The application has high concurrency in the sense that it won't reject requests that are incoming, but it won't perform very well because those waiting requests will actually wait for the threads to get to free themselves up. And this is basically why, for example, uh, uh, a driver like Reactive Mongo is, is more forward looking at it. It's, more, uh, uh, it's, it's an advancement, for example, from the uh, JDBC drivers, current JDBC drivers, in the fact that it's not blocking because it actually allows the threads, like it allows the, 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 the request processor to actually wait for the result, yield the thread, and resume once the result from the database have been, has been retrieved. So basically, I'm not, getting a, like I'm not taking advantage of the uh, uh, non-blocking I.O. model only at the, uh, at the web end let's say, of the request processing, and also taking of the advantage of the non-blocking model at the, uh, uh, at the database access level of the, of the request processing. Another advantage, I can really delegate the whole thing to a completely new set, like to a completely different thread pool. So imagine that I have two types of operations, like very simple, very basic reads that should go very, very fast, and these like relatively heavy uh, backend access requests. Now, backend access requests will be slow by definition. There's nothing I can do about it. So they will keep being slow while the threads in foreground keep servicing the faster requests. That's a huge benefit, and that's a huge architectural benefit. And this is why, for example, this is essentially why, um, again, why I like this. Uh, example so much. And you actually, if you see the difference between this action implementation and this action implementation is that like, even if you don't know Scala, even if you don't know Play, th this is kind of self-explanatory that this action will be processed synchronously basically in the same thread, whereas this action will be processed asynchronously. And eventually, it waits for the, uh, so basically by deferring the invocation to the database and using map to collect the result when it's available and send it to this, uh, to this function that actually does uh, the rendering and building the response. However, once this invocation has started, the foreground thread that actually processes the request is free to pick up another request and, and run with it. So what does it do though? It has to return data. It will return data. 
the problem is that it's not the thread that, had, that processes the current request. So basically, what happens is, essentially, the current request is moved on hold, waiting on an essentially one on a, on a, on a operating system uh, call which says there is data available. And when it is data available, then it's woken up, gets another thread, and renders the request, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I understand that part, but it still has to wait to render the data. It doesn't wait. So it's, it's, waiting, it's waiting on, like it's not waiting in an active state. Yes, you as a recipient of the response will wait. Yeah. It doesn't work faster because there is the request, like the response itself, is right. slow. But you're not blocking everyone else. I say the, the socket, the socket stays open, but the thread that read the request and started this—that's is, correct. Isn't necessarily the same thread that will later respond. Exactly. So is it kind of like two thread pools, one for the receiving request and one for like slow? You can do that. You can do that. It's not the default, but it's possible. Like it's it's a type of design that. Uh, well, that's the thing. Like, this is possible. That, that's the that's MongoDB is not transactional. No, I'm talking about previous previous examples. We have said that we should have some transactions. How labor of the thread? Uh, well, for the for the date, like for eBeans, eBeans has its own transaction system. So I can take a, a controller method, annotate it with transactional, and it will run in a transaction. It also has a, a transaction. Uh, so it has some sort of a a template type of thing, just like Spring, but actually allows you to run uh, to run queries in a transaction. Well, how do you mean? I'm not sure that I follow. Well, transaction data stays on the thread, so that the transaction context will stay on the thread. You can't switch threads. You can't switch threads in the middle of a transaction, if that's the question that you're asking. The asynchronous model doesn't apply with transactions at all. So that's like, honestly, you can't. Like, it's not nothing that has to do with play or with anything like that. Like transactions, transactions and processing asynchronously and thread switching is a no-go. You can try it, like you can try doing something with XA if you really want to, but you probably should. Like it's it's extremely expensive. Like maintaining a transactional context, for example, across across multiple threads and stuff like that. I'm still wondering how this is even how this increases concurrency because yes, the thread can now go back and receive another request, but it can't it can't respond to the request. You still have to wait. No, it it can respond to the request because. That's that's what I'm that's what I'm saying. The current, like the current thread, the current, like the the read yields, yes. yields its uh, so yields the thread until it is like until data becomes available from the like from the uh, from the backend from the backend exactly. I think, I think the two big advantages to this model in terms of efficiency, one is that you don't need as many threads because you don't have uh, you don't have a thread blocked when the database is thinking. Yes. So the, the amount of because a thread is a fixed amount of memory for the stack, the amount of memory that's allocated to thread stacks is less because the number of threads is less. Yes. Uh, yes. Thanks for thanks for thanks for saying that. Yeah, because that's something that I don't. Like I, I kind of take it for granted by saying that fewer threads are better. I guess my question is, what are you gonna, what's the other thread going to do, though? Just wait for more data. Okay. Right. Yeah, and the second thing is that the number of threads that the scheduler has to schedule is also smaller. So the scheduler can be faster at choosing the next threads to run. That's a tragic statement. Yeah. Kind of a moot point, though, really. Terabytes of data, terabytes of RAM these days. Isn't sure, sure. Yeah, well, the scheduler is dealing with like 32 threads instead of 4,000 threads. Well, imagine that it's not only like th there are multiple multiple reasons for 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 something like this. It's not only like sure you have terabytes of data, but clients also expect like clients also evolve. Like they're not having terabytes of data for sending like 
very small responsive necessarily, right? That's about right. terabytes of RAM. Terabyte RAM. Yeah, but you have terabytes of, of clients too. So usually those systems have a super high load as well. So it's in your advantage to actually try to reduce, like to, to try to reduce that, uh, the load because there's always going to be, you always want to have more clients that you need to service than, than your capacity. Like that's always, it's always like that. I, I, I understand. It looks like what this other friend's going to do. What? So my opinion is that your objection is valid. I'm just trying to phrase the, the argument well, for, for the non-blocking model. But in, at the end, you're really, you're reinventing what the OS did. Anyway, like the threat abstraction is well, usually, problem. but usually the non-blocking model usually cooperates with the with the OS as well. Right. If so you select and pull at the, at exactly. The kernel call level, exactly. Yeah. So you can you can actually defer like some of some of those calls and some of that waiting actually is just solved by just deferring to to the OS to actually interrupt you when data is available and basically bring you back in the foreground. Right. Yeah. Because select and pull. Are separate from, from the actual process scheduling. Yeah. 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 So there are, there are benefits in that. Like, there are benefits in this model. And the reduction of, of, the reduction of thread pools, essentially, is not a minor thing, even if you have capacity. <coughs> right. Um, sure. So let's, let, let's finish this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a movie as well. And then one thing that I have here is I need a form definition. So this is basically how play in its Scala incarnation binds data to the forms. So this is a form definition. Basically, it says that this is a Scala tuple. So it's a collection of values. It says that I'm binding this, like these fields, to these uh, elements in the tuple. And this is also how uh, this is also an example of uh, of validation, validating criteria. So, in some sense, I might be biased a little bit here, but I like this uh, model a little bit better because it's more DSL-like. Like I'm reading this, and I kind of understand exactly what this form binding is supposed to do, and what are the uh, what are the conditions that the input has to satisfy in order to uh, to work. So, let me just start this project. So I have two errors right now. One is that I don't have a, uh, there are two errors, basically. One is that uh, I need the JSON serializer and deserializer for, for my data. So I need to map uh, movie to JSON, one form or another. And I'm going to create that. And the other thing that I need to do is uh, I'm going to need to add the same thing for um, other data in my form. And the third thing that I have to do is I have to specify an execution context. Okay. For, the, for the asynchronous call. So the way this thing, the way these two calls work is that they actually expect. So if you look at the, at the find method, 
sorry, if we look at the cursor method, not find. a bit of time to compile. I'm going to use the same example. I'm going to use 90, and it works. Like the whole the whole CRUD process has uh, has worked. One thing that I like to do, and that's going to be going to be the last thing for for tonight, because I think we're kind of approaching uh, the rush hour. Is I like to show a little bit more about the. Uh, where the asynchronous model is is good, and what one of the important things that um, we're, we're actually asynchronous request processing works, and that, that's basically chunked responses. So one thing that you can do with this is, like, if you have a very large response, you may not want to build everything in memory at once, and and basically compose the entire response and send it back. You may want to send it in chunks. And it's exactly the kind of thing that this uh, asynchronous streaming model that uh, Reactive Mongo provides allows you to do. Because as it iterates the collection of results, it actually sends back responses to the, uh, uh, to the client. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to create a different type of collection. So I'm going to create something called, sorry, it's Mongo, not Mongo. Uh, what is it called? So you're talking about moving data from a database to the socket in chunks without consuming a thread while you're Yes. Okay. Well, I'm using, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, okay. exactly. So I guess, is that just taking advantage of pipelining in HTTP when you get it to the client? Well, it's not taking advantage of pipelining because the request remains open. There's so only one request. There's only one request. There is only one request. It just doesn't, it just doesn't build everything in memory. Well. It just delivers it. Like the request stays open, but data continues to flow to the client. It streams it. It streams it. it. it, streams you it. Even, you it's can even do that with a thread if you're like using the thread to copy data from the database yes. to the socket. But you're talking about doing it even without having a thread. Yes. Actually by having by having the by having the non blocking support in the like in reactive Mongo actually waking up the uh, basically, waking up the thread when it actually has some yeah. has some response. So the database has like a new chunk of data. Exactly. It sends to the JVM, and the JVM wakes up and selects any available thread, which then formats that stuff and sends it out on the socket, and then the thread goes away again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to create a collection and. I'm going to create something called a capped collection, which is basically a circular queue in uh, Mongo. The advantage of this collection is essentially that they allow the so-called uh, tailable cursors. Tailable cursors mean that there are cursors that stay open. So as soon as there is more data in the collection, it's like a continuous query, really. 
Uh, as long so as you query that keeps getting more results as you add stuff. Exactly. Neat. Yes. So I'm going. <laughs> so I'm going to. What I'm going to do very it's quickly. Like a, a query that that keeps running even when it runs out of results in the available data. Yes. And when you insert more, it returns more results. Yes. Uh, well, that's that's a good question. Well, you can't. <laughs> that's how the, like capped collections, capped collections in Mongo. I'm using capped collection more like the example of something that produces data as you add more to it, and basically like the reader, the uh, the recipient, like the actually the process that runs a query on the capped collection actually receives more data. Uh, capped collections do not allow, like the only thing that they allow is inserts. You can't remove data, you can't do updates. So all you can do is like reload. But they're circular. So basically once they reach a certain capacity, they start recycling the buffer. It's like a message. It's like a message. It's, it is like a message. It's the same pattern, really. It's, all right, so I'm going to create this collection, and I'm going to do a very, I'm going to show you a method. I have a few more examples here. It's um, a deal with like content negotiation and stuff like that. Obviously, we won't have time for that, so I'm going to do this. See how I'm asking for a tailable cursor, and I'm asking for. Um, actually for the result to come in JSON format. So basically what I'm saying is I want a, like I want a continuous query here. See the difference between um, what I did with this particular query when I'm saying collect all the results in the list and return them. And here when I'm actually using an enumerator. This is basically I'm telling, I'm telling that all I want is to, re to have something that will return more results to this uh, chunked response uh, processor. Does it wait for a certain size? Sorry? Does it wait for a certain size? No, as soon as they're available. As soon as it's available. You can, you can actually do, like it's, it, you can actually do bulk processing. So you can tell them, you can instruct the enumerator to actually enumerate in bulk the results. So you can have something like this here, right? Max documents. But this doesn't tell you anything. Like it can be, it's, it's completely at the discretion of the, uh, uh, <coughs> of the framework to some extent. They may buffer them and send them to you or not. Okay, and I'm going to add this route here. So I think this is probably a better illustration of what's actually the benefit of this non-blocking blo not blocking um, model. So let's move here. Now it's it's reloading. I'm gonna go to messages. Doesn't get anything. And I'm gonna say db dot messages insert title mm. title. See, fortunately, I'm using Safari for this, which is not the best thing to show because the initial content has been empty. It refuses to render anything afterwards. So <coughs> look, at, look at just this. See the content coming in. And now I'm inserting new, more data. You see new more yeah, content yeah. returned to the browser and so on and so forth. So that's one model. Probably it's not like streaming is, is good for data. The enumerator actually, and like this pattern, the enumerator driven is more better for 
something even more, uh, something even closer to an event-driven model like WebSockets. Now you can imagine, rather than having this polling request actually sitting for the request to end, having a WebSocket. Actually, I also have a WebSocket example. I'm sorry? There's a couple people making streaming databases. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, 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 I'm using, actually, I'm kind of abusing Mongo for this example to actually showcase streaming of responses. I don't have, like, anything that produces content, essentially, and anything that produces, like, uses an, that's an enumerator can actually be the basis of that. Would it be possible to take a look at the inspector to see what the actual um, uh, transfer encoding is, or just the HTTP headers themselves? Um, the HTTP headers? Sure. <clears throat> mm, sorry. Uh, yeah, I didn't finish, and they don't. Uh, let me see. Let me see with curl. If curl. It's using chunked. Yeah, it's using the chunk for the response. As I say, I'm kind of abusing this example, like for the sake of demonstrating the like the streaming of data. Right, right. But it's I think it's an interesting use case for like okay, for showing how, how simple the Yeah it is. It's interesting though because when you, I was just reading this when you use that chunk transfer encoding, then it actually enables to have something like an async to use something like NIO async. Right. Yeah. Well, it relies on. Yeah, it's that's more of an information to the like, the fact that the that the uh, response actually says that the chunk keeps like tells the browser essentially not to stop receiving like it's still there's still until until the request has ended they, they actually have to have to wait as long as they want to wait there's more information to the to the client it's uh, to the client itself but still that, that's what kind of I wanted to convey the idea of a incoming stream of data through various mechanisms more that's than that. okay so that's all I have to show you. Like, I have a few more examples, but I don't have time. So thank you for attending, and I hope you kind of enjoyed the, the introduction to play. Um, and you know, if you have any questions or anything like that, um, drop me an email, direct me on, on Twitter. Yes, I'll stay for beer. Um, one, one last thing that I, I want you to say, thank you. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to say about like the usage is basically what, what I see about it is that yeah it's very performant it's very cool it works very well I see two use cases mainly for 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 play and we are using it as a uh, like for for a, more like a dashboard uh, con uh, uh, like management console type of thing because it's very productive and it's very easy to write stuff in the other use case that I personally see for it and I promise that I'm done with that, is uh, microservices. Because it's very easy to actually write and deploy a standalone service in play. I haven't shown you how distribution works, but you have to take my word that you actually just run a play dist, creates a zip, and then you take the zip. The zip has a shell script in it. You start it, and all of a sudden, you have a running server. So that's pretty cool. And that deployability and the ability of writing something very, very quickly is kind of critical when you think of uh, applications that consist of isolated pieces of code, like exactly like microservices work. So I think, I think it's another use case, another interesting thing to think about. Scala. It slows down. Scala is a bit slower, but you can mitigate, like with uh, a build server and uh, like 
if, for example, if your IDE has, uh, has, an, in has an integrated build server, like uh, IntelliJ does, uh, like Scala has this mechanism of, of uh, essentially keeping a compiler running, like a compiler process running, and just uh, sending what, whatever needs to be compiled to it. And it's basically, it's kind of a warm start in that respect. And that actually, that makes compilation really, really faster as you move on. Is that something that does specifically for like Razor? No, no, that's, no, that's, uh, that's Scala. And IntelliJ, and it's not even specific to IntelliJ. Like IntelliJ just has a plugin for it. All right, thanks, and uh, sorry for keeping up a little bit more. <laughs> okay, well, thanks again. <laughs>